Well, we were in SW. Oh, yeah, you know that guy. You know that guy in SW? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, we were actually in Rutgers. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the question was the end of SDS, or uh, the end of the weather. Um, it's very simple. When an organization, any organization, realizes how irrelevant it is, it turns in on itself. And you have your own internal faction fighting. What's the mistake? And a one group said, we, we weren't worker-oriented enough. Now, the workers, that's a panacea of the Marxist left, that the workers will always rise up. And that's been going on since 1844. The Communist Manifesto. Yeah. So, no, I don't know. When's the Communist Manifesto? 1848. So, the workers, that, that's a built in solution. And then there's, there's our built in solution was the third world. Well, the third world wasn't doing that well. You know? And, and the people, and, and our solution was militancy will attract support. Well, mil militancy does not attract support. Organizing. <laughs> So we had this huge internal faction fight over what went wrong, and people turned in on each other. Actually, by that time, I was out of the organization. I had dropped out in the first year, in 1970, because um, I could see that things weren't right. It was also a personal crisis, because I, I felt like I didn't have the courage to be a real revolutionary. But uh, really what I think what it was, was I, I recognized that the strategy was crazy. You know? but, um, so th there's this internal faction fight over who had the true line. And, 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 and I mean, there's a, uh, I wrote a little about this in the book. Um, a, a new faction of younger people who uh, captured the organization, and they caused the old leadership to recant. It's all crazy. It's, it, it goes under the word Stalinism. <laughs> but that's a whole other thing. We don't even know who Joseph Stalin was. So, um, but, but, it, 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 but by then, the new left had pretty much ended anyway. So, so that, that's another part of the story. Um, I, I wanted to respond, if I could, uh, to Professor Scott's comments about the Black Panther Party. And, and, and because this, uh, I, I, I can't possibly emphasize enough the importance of black power and this also dovetails with their point about white privilege. The importance of black power to white kids who wanted to be radical. In, in New York, there was this guy named Malcolm X, who was now on a stamp, believe it or not. But Malcolm X was, was, was saying, by any, black liberation by any means necessary. By any means necessary. And he had been murdered in 65, in the spring of 65, while well, I was still in high school. But his, in a way, his memory um, permeated Columbia University because he had been there a lot talking. And he lived only a few blocks away. And in 70, no, 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 no. In 65, the end of 65, beginning of 66, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X came out. And everybody read it. Everybody read it. That's just like absolute. So black power, and also the other thing, and this is very important. SDS was related organizationally to a black organization in the South called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. And SNCC had been organizing in the worst, most vicious, violent, terroristic place in the entire country in the Mississippi Delta region. Had been organizing a uh, they've been organized in a lot of places, but that particular place had been mur there were murders, there were uh, violent uh, violence by the police and by the, the, the white citizens council, and 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 SNCC had successfully organized a massive voter rights movement in the in a place where there were no black people at all registered, and had won, and they had organized. A Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which had had challenged the white, total white Mississippi, uh, Mississippi Democratic Party for seats at the national convention in 1964. So this was the, they were the radicals of the radicals, and they were they were the most on the line. 
And they were the organization that SDS looked to and learned from. Like the concept, which is now around, <coughs> called participatory democracy, actually came from SNCC and from their guru, whose name is uh, Miss Ella J. Baker. Now this, the reason I'm mentioning this, it, it goes back to your question, or maybe it was your question, uh, somebody's question about what to do. Um, I've been making a personal, I, I suggest people study successful social movements. And I've been making a, my own study of the Sikh Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the South. And asking the question, how did they do it? How were they successful? And fortunately, a book has been written on that called I've Got the Light of Freedom by Charles M. Payne. And we say took one, he took one, he's a, a, an African American sociologist who took one town in Mississippi, Greenwood, Mississippi, and, and, and went and, and talked to people about how did SNCC organize? And who was, you know, and he, you learn a lot. However, after these events of 64, murders, the successful voting rights movement, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the movement was betrayed by white liberals in the Democratic Party. Hubert Humphrey and Lyndon Johnson. And so when I came along, I didn't want to be a white liberal. I didn't want to, want to sell out the movement. I wanted to support black power. And that was one of the drives within SDS, was the support for this increasing militancy in the black movement by any means necessary. Now, there's a lot to be said about this. And this is where you and we might get, I, I, I hope we're going to get into an interesting discussion. The Black Panther Party took the by any means necessary slogan. And they were called the Black, they were called the Black Panther Party for self-defense. But they marched around in, in, in Sacramento, California, in Oakland, California, with guns. That was part of their strategy. Well, that strategy inevitably got the white power strength, the government, to attack them. And ultimately, because of the guns and because they were doing social organizing, real, real organizing in the black community, but a lot because of the guns and the by any means necessary, they were wiped out. Dozens were murdered. And, and the party, which had a large base, the base evaporated. And my conclusion off of this is that don't run around with guns. <laughs> I'm about to say, I'm about to say no, something. I knew you were going to say that. But before you, yeah. I just want to say that. When you repeat the word. Victoria, I will vote first. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, the, 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 the Minister of Defense of the Black Panther Party was a guy named Huey Peter. He was in jail. When he came out of jail, he told the Black Panther Party to put away the guns. And they did, but it was too late. The, 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 the federal government and the local governments had already organized the attack, and it was too late. So, yes. Okay, here's what I want to insert, okay? Because I think the thing I'm enjoying the most about having this discussion mm -hmm. is that Imagine all these years of my life, I've had, I've had no chance to ever talk to somebody who had the other side of the experience. So no matter what I say, I'm adding to the story, yes, okay? Yes, yes. It's not a critique of him, it's adding to the story, all right? Okay, that's one. Second of all, <laughs> you know, the black, mem many members of the Black Panther Party before it was formulated were involved in organizing in the South. Right. And the symbol of the Black Panther is one of the things that an illiterate population could read in the South because the original roots of the Black Panther Party was about voter registration in the South. So you're absolutely right. So they went into that booth and they saw that Black Panther and they were instructed to vote and that's how they swept and they began to make changes in the South. But what happened is, as you pointed out, there's always that ideological and internal debate in any kind of political organization. What should we do now? I think Mao asked that. <laughs> But every time you always ask, what the hell should we do now, okay, once we have achieved this goal? Because the question of voting to empower people in the South who have been disenfranchised did not answer the question, right, of how people did not have power in other parts of the United States and the agenda of democracy was not expanded enough. So one of the internal, I mean, 
you talk about internal conflicts that happened in, in, the, in the South, was that some of the leadership in the South began to say, you know what, we need black power. And if we need black power, where are you white people? Y'all need to take your ass back up where you came from and make changes in your own community. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's convenient for you to be in our community talking about justice, but go back to your racist community and begin to deal with issues. That so the whites were thrown out of snip. That's it. I want to get to that point. Three. <laughs> and in doing so, then it's being thrown out. There were those who, of course, were disenfranchised, right, and said, wow, I was trying to do something. I wanted to help. But there were those who said, we need to expand this agenda. And, and the people that I met in SDS were the people who were in this group who said, look, we need to make democracy accountable to what it is. All right? So that's the SDS I met. And they were fantastic in my area in Michigan, maybe in Europe, but they certainly were in mine. And they then began to build coalition with black organizations that were on the ground that were, in fact, being harassed by the police. Because, by the way, at 14 and 15, I was organizing after school programs and breakfast programs while the police were harassing the shit out of us, right? Mm -hmm. For giving people food. Yes. Yes. For giving people food, right? right? OK. So by the time this stuff happens in California, where we become a defense party, is because there had been also another contradiction, a, a debate within the, Africa, within the Black Panther Party, and that was, if we're going to defend ourselves, how are we going to change our situation? And this is where it's important to understand where do revolutionaries get their models from, right? And one of the models, and this is where I think it gets really hairy for both groups, for SDS and also for the Black Panthers, and I think it adds to it the level of our demise is that they then turned to where were people fighting. And they looked to what was happening in Africa. What was going on in Africa? In 1957, there was the first black movement to make Ghana independent. So they, were, they borrowed, conceptually, this model of being colonized, right? So all of a sudden, this analysis of the Black Panther was that it was a colony inside of America. What do colonies do? What the American Revolutionary did. They rebelled. They called for revolution. So again, we're mixing and matching circumstances, right, to try to explain. By the way, the FBI, the Contel Pro had already been launched. Yes. They were undermining organizations. Yes. They were, had definitely infiltrated every college organization that I was in. Yes. And we kicked their ass because we found out who they were and we beat the shit out of them. <laughs> so we were already doing it. But what was important to me is that we were borrowing from conceptions of political empowerment that were not possible in the United States. Right. And I think that's where you're right. Because also, anti-colonial struggles, if you do notice, are national liberation struggles, yes. which means people in the country fight against the power of, in their own country. That's a dual, po you know, dual power struggle. That ain't going to happen in the United States. <laughs> so part of what happened with SDS, at least the local group that I knew, and the ones that fractioned, is that they were trying to ask the question of, what do we do after Vietnam? Okay? What are we going to do in the long run? How are we going to empower? How are we going to make democracy own itself? And I think that's where the factions of, of going beyond power began to talk about using violence, right? Because they were met with violence. I'm not saying that's wrong. History always says what is. But my, my point is we don't, that, that what I want. What I want to share as somebody who was involved with that is that we were young people. We weren't we young? Yes. We were super young. We knew very little. We were borrowing what we could borrow from other places. And there was really no mechanism to it to you know, arm ourselves. Those were great ideas. We were not fighting a national liberation struggle within the context of the United States. You know, and we were and by the way,